of Jesus Christ. We want to welcome everyone to our online service. We are glad that you are able to watch this service. And today is July 11th, 2020. We are in our first week of July 2020. We want to welcome you. Opening song, let's all join in and singing 623. 623, I will follow thee, my Savior. Wheresoever my Lord may be, with the focus I will follow thee. And yes, my Lord, I follow thee. 623 from SDA Kingdom. And it's entitled as, I will follow thee.
us out. In Jesus' name I pray. Today is July 11, 2020, and we are in the second week. We are in the second week of July 2020. And I hope the Lord of Heaven will bestow His blessing upon us as we go through this Sabbath school lesson, which is absolutely very good and it is entitled as Winsome Witness, the Power of Personal Testimony. Uh, one of the most uh, powerful lessons that we have, and uh, the most practical lessons that we can be able to gain through as we go through the Sabbath school lesson today. Winsome witness, the power of personal testimony. The memory text is taken from Acts chapter 4, verse 20. Acts chapter 4, verse 20. The Bible says, For we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. Once again, I repeat it says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So the fulcrum of the message in Acts chapter 4 verse 20 is, uh, what is that these apostles have seen and what is that the apostles have heard? They can never keep silent but keep on speaking about. You know, speaking is an art. Speaking is a gift. Hearing is a gift. But the thing is, what you speak is what you hear. So what you hear is very important. And what you hear is what you experience. And what you experience is what we can speak. We can have a play of words in this text. But the important part of the message today in the book of Acts is that what we hear is absolutely very important before we could act and before we get into a business of speaking. And there is an unusual part in a personal testimony. Of course, we speak about this happened to this person and this person experienced this way. And that's the reason we have to do this way. Many a times we try to give an example of a whole lot of people who have achieved, you know, uh, their goals in life and uh, give an example of them and we should be able to follow this type of principles. But when our hearts are warmed by certain things, it will be better that our personal, what we have experienced in our life can be shared that can be able to give a lot of motivation for others. You see, there is an unusual power, that's what the Sabbath school lessons say, in a personal testimony, then to grow up with people, what, 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 what has happened to them. When our hearts are warm by Christ's love, you know, the other name for God is love. So when God, when you talk about God, what if one thing just uh, puzzles uh, or what if one thing just comes to my mind is love. God is love. So when we are warm by Christ's love and we are changed by His grace, there is nothing that you and I can change ourselves uh, unless the grace of God is given to us. So we have something significant to say about who this God is all about based on our experience. It is one thing to share about Jesus. Or it is one thing that we can share what God has done to another person. But it would be greater if you and I could experience what God has done in your life and my life and share that as a testimony to others. And that would be the most powerful, the most powerful way how you and I could be able to witness for Christ. It is always, it is always difficult to argue against a personal testimony because that's the experience and that's the experience that people are looking forward to. People may debate our theology or the interpretation of the word of God or even scoff at religion in general. They will not agree with a lot of things what we have been believed. But when an individual can say, I once was hopeless, 
but now I have hope. I was filled with guilt, but now I have peace. I was purposeless, but now I have a purpose. Even skeptics, don't forget this one. Even skeptics are impacted by the power of the gospel. When you and I experience Christ in such a way, I think so. We can make an impact on people's life. So it's an individual basis. Your relationship with God. Who God is all about for you, not for others. What he has done for you, not for others. What he can do in your life from negativity to positivity in your life. And that's experience with Christ. And that's one of the reasons it's called his relationship, right? And I always feel Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship between one to one persona. Although some people may experience a sudden dramatic conversation like an Apostle Paul uh, on, the, on, the, on, on the road to Damascus. Uh, you know the story about this. Uh, Paul encounters, saw, encounters you know, God or Jesus Christ personally. Uh, more often, our conversation occurs as a portion, as a growing recognition of the preciousness of who this Jesus is all about. It is a deep appreciation of his amazing grace that he has bestowed upon you and me to be saved. And a supreme sense of gratitude for the salvation that he freely offers for you and me. And Christ, basically I always feel he radically he refocuses our lives from negativity to positivity. And then, it is this witness that the world is so desperately needing. Your experience when you speak to another person. So witnessing that, basically the right to feel is what you experience with Christ has to be taken and given to the person who has been absolutely in a devastated world. That's what this gospel is all about. That's what the good news is all about. So the good news of the gospel has to work in your heart and my heart and experience Christ as who he is all about and is freely given salvation, is freely given grace and by his grace you and I could be able to be overcomers and that experience if you and I could be able to share with I'm telling you, what you hear, what you see, what you experience will play a pivotal role in witnessing in this last days. And uh, if you have to go to Mark chapter 5, verse 15 and 20, and uh, you'll be able to find uh, a very, very important aspect of uh, a witness here. And uh, it is entitled as Unlike Your Witnesses. Uh, in this uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 15 and 20, uh, we come across this beautiful story. Uh, the word Decapolis comes from the word Deca, which stands in Polis City. The region of Decapolis was an era of 10 cities along the shores of the Sea of Galilee in the first century. And these 10 cities were bound together by a common language and a culture. And there was a demonic was known by many people in this region. You and I know the story. And this demon possessed man was completely alienated and many people know who this guy was. And then what happened? This demonic was known by many people in that region. He had struck fear into their hearts through, their, through, his, uh, through his unpredictable violent behavior. And that's the time you and I have, you know, this great man, or God himself, that is Jesus Christ, that saw him who had longed for something better. And so he miraculously delivered this man from the demons, that, uh, that from these demons who tormented him day and night. Many people were in fear of this man. And this man wanted a better life, most probably. Jesus recognized that. He pitied him. And Jesus wanted to deliver him from this demon. When the townspeople heard that Jesus had permitted this demon to possess their herds of swine, 
and that the swine had to run over the cliff into the sea. They came out to see this person who this Jesus is all about was caused a lot of destruction for the swines. You see here, <laughs> they were not worried about uh, the person who has been healed. You will like all the story, right? Jesus casting, you know, the devil to get into the, you know, herd or herds of swine. And the whole swine herd, it just fell off from the cliff. And, uh, you know, there was a loss for uh, the people who have been taking care of the swines. And then, what happened? Mark's gospel record that they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had a legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid and the man was whole again physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. The essence of the gospel is to what? If you and I be able to read the stories of the witnesses either it might be a Samaritan woman, either it might be a demon possessed man, either a person who was blind. So, the essence of the gospel is to restore people broken by sin to the wholeness Christ has created them for. And that's what the gospel is all about. This demon possessed man was healed and he was in a right frame of mind once people they saw him were afraid and now he is absolutely been very calm and then what happened what better person to reach this ten cities of Decapolis that a transformed demonic could share his testimony with the entire region and I like the statement of what sister Ellen White states here about this it says, as witnesses for Christ, uh, we are to tell what we know. And that's the beauty of it. And what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt. If we have been following Jesus step by step, we shall have something right to the point to tell concerning the way in which he has led us. And we can tell how we have tested his promise and found his promises to be absolutely true. And we can bear witness. When I talk about this death of all this, and just imagine the man who was relieved by the demon position by Jesus himself. And he has experienced and he has tasted and he know what the promises of his word is not because Jesus had oriented him in every angle, I guess. So what do you think so this demon possessed man will be here to do? Most probably he will go to the same ten cities. Take up all this. I don't think so. He is going to be a witness because people saw him before as what a demon possessed man. He was not stable in his mind, in his thought. And now he's absolutely fine. He is sane. He is healed by Christ. And what he does? He will be able to go as a testimony. Don't think so people will believe it. Man, people see him. What has happened? What Jesus could do, and that's what. Is winning souls for Christ. I don't know how many people were converted when this, you know, demon was a man started giving testimony. Just like Saul became Paul when he started giving testimony. What happened? A whole lot of things happened, right? And today we read about who Paul is all about. We read about this demon was a man. And it's a witness. I want to ask you a question. What is your story? What have you heard? What have you seen? What have you experienced from Christ? Can you be able to share that experience with people who come in our dear life? We go to another lesson part and it talks about proclaiming the risen Christ. Very, very, very important. And the Bible is absolutely very much clear. If Christ don't have been raised, there was no Christianity at all. It was early Sunday morning, we have another story. You know, and the two Marys hastily made their way to the tomb of Christ. They were not going to ask him for anything. What could a dead man possibly give them, right? The last time they saw him was his body with bloody gooeys and it was broken. It's the last time they saw the, 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 the Jesus Christ. It, 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 that's the situation where he was in. The scene of the cross was just there. But deeply in their minds. Now they were simply doing their duty sorrowfully to just go to the tomb. 
and they make their way to the tomb to embalm his body. The gloomy shadows of despondency engulfed their lives in the darkness of despair. The future was absolutely very much certain, uncertain, and offered little hope for Mary's. When they arrived at the tomb, they were startled to find the tomb was absolutely empty. And then we know that Matthew records this beautiful concept of the event of the resurrection morning in these words. He says, but the angel answered and said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I have known that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Matthew chapter 20 verse 5 and 6. And the woman were now overwhelmed with joy. Because the last thing they saw, Jesus was absolutely, he was bloody, he was bruised, and he was broken. And his body was taken to the tomb to be buried. And they were less hopeless. They didn't know where to go about it, how to just get things done. With all their grief, once the angel of the Lord coming and giving them the gospel or the good news that the, 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 the person, that the Jesus whom they are seeing is not dead, he is raised up. My God, my God, what an experience that Mary would have been felt, with joy, and the dark clouds of sun, sadness faded into the sunlight of the dawning of the resurrection morning, their night of sadness was over, gladness graced their countenance, and songs of rejoicing replaced their tears of Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Please read Mark chapter 6, verse 1 to 11. You'll be able to understand that the implication of the reaction of Mary. After Mary met the resurrected Christ, what she ran to tell the story, good news is for sharing. Good news can't be able to get it. Keep it for yourself. Good news is to share. And what happened to Mary? And she could not be silent at all. Just like the reverend is what Peter was talking about and saying that, no, we cannot keep silent. We have to keep speaking for what we have experienced is not to keep for ourselves. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you and I have not experienced Christ the way how Paul experienced, how the man called demon possessed man experienced, how many experienced, you and I doesn't have anything to share with <laughs> What happened to Mary? She can never be silent. What did she say? Christ was alive. Christ is alive. Christ is alive. His tomb is empty. And the word must go so swiftly as possible. After we too meet the resurrected Christ along the highway of life, we too must run to tell the story for the good news. It is not to keep for yourself, it is to share with one another. How fascinating too, that despite of all the time Jesus had told them what would happen, that he would be killed and then resurrected. You know, the disciples, the ones Jesus specifically chose, refused to believe Mary's testimony. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they also never believed. That's what it recorded in Mark chapter 16 verse 11. Thus, if Jesus' own disciples didn't immediately believe, we shouldn't be surprised if others don't immediately accept our words. Right? Many times it happens. Once we hear the gospel, we expect everything to happen in its course of time. Everything instantaneously. You speak, people have to believe. No, that doesn't happen. Even his own disciples who were very close to Jesus already. Jesus had told them that he is going to be killed, he is going to be buried, and he is going to be resurrected. But still, they were unable to believe. When Mary came and told the story, do you think so they believe? No. Until unless they went and saw the tomb was empty. Many times the gospel will not be so easy as we preach, even though it might be a good news. For some of them, they will not accept it. But eventually, I believe, once they also experience the same way how you and I experience who Jesus is all about, especially the resurrected Christ, there is hope, there is meaning, there is life. There is no option that you and I will never be silent. Go take the gospel. When some, uh, we get quote one other uh, uh, unimportant topic on the Tuesday's lesson, uh, which is entitled as "Changed Lives 
make a difference. Changed lives can make a difference. And I like this because in Acts chapter 4 verse 30, a very important part is we told about these disciples. And who are these disciples? They were untrained men. And they were uneducated. They never had the knowledge of what education is all about. But when they started speaking so boldly about this resurrected, risen Christ, the boldness of what Peter and John were speaking about, they marveled and they realized that these men were with Jesus. Ultimately, the name of Jesus has to be uplifted. Jesus says, Uplift me. Draw all men to me. And as I, call, as I draw all men to God. In the New Testament, the church exploded in growth. You know what happened? After Peter raising up and speaking about the resurrected Christ, after the day of Pentecost, what happened? And you see nearly 3,000 people were baptized and slowly 1,000 people were added during the time of Pentecost, that's recorded in Acts chapter 2 verse 41. And then soon the authorities recognized what was happening. These New Testament believers had been with Christ, their rights were changed, they were transformed by His grace and they could not keep sight. They were transformed. Their life was changed. So if your life and my life have experienced who this risen Christ is all about having the hope in you and me and that transforms our life, there is no, nothing can stop you from keeping this beautiful gospel in your heart. Just like Peter and John, they were never been able to keep silent. They went to the world and started speaking here so boldly even though they were uneducated, even though they were absolutely in a very downtrodden land. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the lives were changed when they heard about the resurrected Christ. And these believers were new in Christ. And they had a story to tell to the people. Peter, a loud mouth fisherman, was transformed by the grace of God. James and John, the sons of thunders who had difficulty controlling their own tempers, were transformed by the grace of God. And who was Thomas? Thomas was nothing but, we call them as, you know, Thomas the believers or Thomas the doubting one. You know, Thomas was a skeptic, but he was transformed by the grace of God. The disciples are the members of the early church had their own stories to tell and they could not keep silent because they were changed. You know, notice the powerful statement of what Sister White has to make in this regard in Steps to Christ. She says it absolutely very clearly. No sooner, no sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in a heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The, save, the saving and the sanctifying truth cannot be shut in his heart. Steps to Christ. Never. And then what happened? Notice too what the religious leaders said in Acts chapter 4 verse 16 will find. They openly acknowledged the reality of the miracle that had been performed. The healed man was standing right there before them. Even with all these, they refused to change their attitude. And yet despite this open defiance, Peter and John were not going to back down from their witnessing. No. Even though they agreed or not, even though they accepted or not, even the religious leader were being able to, you know, see all the witnesses just standing in front of them who are being healed, uh, you know, by Peter and John, by the grace of God, through the name of Jesus Christ. And still, Peter and John were so bold enough to stand and present this beautiful gospel 
because there is none other name that you and I could be saved except the name of Jesus and that was demonstrated by their lives and that was demonstrated just in front of their eyes. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you and I have to be a witness, the first and the foremost thing is a changed life, a transformed life, a new life. And that's what Jesus promised. I'm going to give you a new life. A relationship between knowing Christ and sharing Christ is until unless you know Christ, you can never share Christ. So it should be a personal one-to-one -one experiences. And then what happens? Sharing our experiences becomes a prominent role in our lives. In Acts chapter 26, we find Apostle Paul standing as a prisoner before King Agaripa. He was, you know, he was a, a, a vigorous evangelist. And the people were envying him. And uh, Paul was in prison. And he was taken to the prison. And he was before the king Agaripa. He was speaking directly to the king. And Paul gave his own testimony. That's what we read in Acts chapter 26. Paul gave his own personal testimony talking about his life not only as a persecutor of Jesus' followers, but then after his conversion, his life as a witness to Jesus and the promise of the resurrection of the dead. And then what happened when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, you and I know the story. A Lord spoke to him and said, I have appeared to you for this purpose. What is the purpose? To make you what? A minister and a witness, both of the things that you have seen and the things which I will end reveal to you. Read that in Acts chapter 26 verse 16. So, if, the, if, you are, if you and I could take this very personal, this text very personally, just imagine, if you and I have met Jesus, and if he has spoken to you, I have appeared and spoken to you for this purpose, and he says that, I have chosen you, or I have testified for you for this purpose. What is the purpose? To make you a minister. Don't you think so? The Lord has chosen you and me as a peculiar nation and a chosen generation and a child of God by His grace. For what? To be a minister and to witness both the things that God has allowed you to experience and the things which is yet to reveal for you. Yeah. And then what happens? Sharing our faith is always a dynamic experience. It is telling the story of what Christ has done for us in the past and what he's doing in our lives today and what he will accomplish doing in our lives in the future. Witnessing is never about us. It is always about him, that is God. He is the God who forgives our iniquities. Have you forgiven? Have you experienced the forgiveness? He heals our diseases, crowns us with loving kindness, and satisfies us with good things. That's what Psalms 103, verse 3 and 5 does for. Witnessing is simply sharing our story of His amazing grace. It is a testimony of our own personal encounter with this God of amazing grace. And that's what witnessing is all about. Although John, Peter, Paul, had different life experiences in their lives. They both had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Their experience with Jesus was not that occurred at a particular point in the past that were then over. It was an ongoing daily experience, daily rejoicing of His love and daily walking in the truth of his light. That's what it's all about. In conversion, ever a thing of the past alone, and there's a statement which is told by Sister White. It simply says that every statement about those who thought that past conversion experience is all that matters, as if they were as if they knew something about religion once. They did not need to be converted daily, but we ought every day, every one of us has to be converted in order to be sharing Christ in our lives. Regardless of what your experience in the past might be, if you and I have been able to submit ourselves to Christ, 
and he will give us the same joy and that experience what Paul, Peter, John, the disciples experienced. And he will give you the power to witness. Because ultimately God has chosen you and me and gave these experiences in our lives so that we could be what? Witnesses for others. And there is a power for the personal testimony. Again, looking to Paul, he stands with his great king called King Agrippa. The Apostle Paul stands before this man, the last in the line of a Jewish king, so King Agrippa. The Maccabees, out of the house of Herod, Agrippa professed to be a Jew, but at his heart, he was a Roman. The aged apostle, weary from his missionary journey, we're talking about Paul, he was weary about his missionary journey and battle, scarred in the conflict between good and evil. Stands there, his heart filled with God's love, and his face was radiant with God's goodness. Whatever has happened in his life, whatever persecution and difficulties he has experienced, he can declare that God is good. Agaripa is cynical, he is skeptical. He is hardened and really indifferent to any genuine value system. In contrast, Paul is filled with faith, committed to the truth, the stalwart indifference of righteousness. The contrast between the two men could be not much more evident. At this trial, Paul requests to speak and receives permission from Agaripa. What does it mean? It simply means that kindness opens heart where abrasiveness closes them. Paul is incredibly gracious to Agaripa here. He calls him an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. He then launches into the discussion of his conversation with King Agaripa. The beauty is this. Paul's testimony of how Jesus changed his life had a powerful impact on a godless king. There is no witness and effect you as a changed life. The witness of a life genuinely converted has an amazing influence on others. Even godless kings are moved by lives transformed by his grace. Even if we don't have the dramatic story as Paul. We should all be able to tell others about what it means to know Jesus and to be redeemed by his blood. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when some witness, there is power in the personal testimony. The essence of a Christian life is a relationship with Jesus Christ that is so rich, so full that we long to share with others. As important to correct doctrine is it cannot substitute for the life transformed by grace and changed by love. The Savior knew that no argument, however logical, would melt hard hearts or break through the crux of worldliness and selfishness. He knew that the disciples must receive the heavenly endowment that the gospel would be effective only as it was proclaimed by hearts made warm and lips made eloquent by the living knowledge of him who is the way, the truth and the life. So as we go through this Sabbath school lesson, this quarter, may we also have an opportunity to experience and taste and see that the Lord is good, is sweeter than honey, let it transform, let the gospel transform my life and your life. May the gospel help us to change our way of thinking about who this resurrected Christ is all about. May this gospel bring us hope in our own personal life so that we can take this same gospel of the good news for the people who come in and our life. May his name be glorified. And I hope that you all uh, enjoyed uh, the Sabbath school lesson. And I believe this will enable each one of us and get motivated to witness for Christ in this last days. And certainly through our lives and through our testimony and through our changed life, we can bring hope.
for many people who are in a hopeless situation. That's my prayer for you this morning.
your health matters and your happiness is important. Author is unknown. Once again, I repeat, never apologize for leaving a situation to make yourself happier. Your health matters and your happiness is important. It's time to seek the Lord in prayer. Let us pray that God will heal the sick and that we are not lax about taking care of our health. If you have any concerns and prayer requests, please do email us or call us and we are here to pray for you. Let's seek the Lord in prayer. Gracious God in heaven, we are here in the second week, the month of July. We are focusing on health matters. The help that you have given to us so far that is so important. We don't want to take it for granted. Because we know that this body is the temple of God. We have to safeguard from all maladies, all sicknesses. But only by your grace, O oh Father, we can be healed. We want the power touch of Jesus Christ so that we could be made whole in the sin sick world. We come in ourselves this morning as we come to your throne of grace with heart full of gratitude and thanksgiving for the way that you have marvelously, miraculously led us, giving us another Sabbath. We might be able to worship you today. Yes, Lord, may your presence go with us. Help us to experience the joy of listening to your word. At this time, I want to pray for the Hope Side Community Church of Fathers. You are prompted this church for a reason. Give us an opportunity to witness for you in these last days. I want to pray for every member of Hope Side Community Church. Wherever they might be listening to your word today, may you empower them with your spirit. If anyone who sick come and stand so far, Lord of heaven, may the name pierce hand of Christ touch them with healing physically, spiritually, mentally. I want to pray for people who have been infected with COVID-19. But well, all I know this virus is not going to go away so soon. You had a purpose in allowing this to happen in this world, O oh Father. But Lord of heaven, may your mercy endure with those people who have been affected. May the rain be a stand of Christ, O Father, by your grace, be able to touch them. Bring healing, O Father. Help us to be conscious. Help us to be a part of you. We know that there is no other way that you and I could be secure except by Jesus and Jesus alone. We take on to you, O Father. Have mercy on our lives so that we could be safe and secure in the arms of Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord, especially I want to pray for the Andhra in a special way and his lovely wife who are aging. Continue to be with them and protect them. To the last breath of their life, they could still be able to be fine without any difficulty. I want to pray for the two lovely children who are taking care of them. Bless them abundantly, give them the patience, give them the tolerance, so that the Father, as they came to the needs of the parents, may they be blessed. I want to pray for many people who are in need of your love today. Wherever they might be, be close to them. At this part of the moment, as we open your word, may your presence go with us. Empower us with your spirit, with your wisdom, and with your understanding. You chosen me to speak today. It is not that I let the words of my mouth and the meditation of a heart be acceptable in thine sight. In Jesus' name I pray. It's time to appeal for the offering. And uh, I know during this hard time, it's difficult for everyone. But at the same time, we have to render unto the Lord what He has been given to us and what He has been bestowed and what He has been blessed with. So, we want to appeal to you that you can send your offerings by email or going online to our website and give your offerings by PayPal too. Our website is website.org. 
where you'll be able to find our countless and the way to offering online. We want to encourage you to support us on the ministry of Hopeside Community Church as we give liberally to him and his service. For the scripture meditation we have taken from John chapter 4 verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee the living water. May God bless the portion of the scriptures just been read. Once again, good morning and happy Sabbath to each one. Now we are in the second week. We are in the second week of the month. If you have to remember seeing me back four months ago, the second week, we had the shutdown happening because of COVID-19. Four months have gone by. Can we see any changes? Can we see any changes? In fact, uh, according to the yesterday's report, it says the COVID-19 has been in a very in increase, alarming increase. 72,000, 73,000 people have been infected within 24 hours. Why? Four months have started are shutting down and still we have what? The increase of COVID-19 spreading so fast. <laughs> you see, we listen to a lot of stories in the TV. People who have been affected. People who have been infected with COVID-19. You know, the only say, the only way, the only way is make sure that social distancing has to be maintained. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Simple rules which we have taught from the beginning when we were children. It was the simple rules. Washing hands, being safe, taken away help by your friends. Health is very important. Once you lose it, you will never get it back. And ask the people who have been infected. Ask the person who doesn't have legs. Ask the person who is blind. Ask the person who is suffering from uh, 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 cancer. Ask the person about uh, uh, when he has been absolutely affected by COVID-19. You will be able to get a different answer altogether. Please take care of your health. And that's the reason Hopeside Community Church always focuses on health matters. So every second week, we do address about what health is all about. Because ultimately, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came down to this earth, the first thing is he came and healed the sick. Why? That was very important. I'm telling you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, please make sure don't take COVID-19 for granted. It has come to stay. But follow the basic principle. Stay away. Have a six foot distance. Be hygienic. And take care of your health. If you have not been able to do this, we have to face the doldrums. We have to face the consequences. It will be too late. And people are challenged with COVID-19. They have COVID-19 parties, that's what I've heard. And people are infected and people have died. Thousands of people. We as Hopeside Community Church, it's not only we proclaim, we want to make sure that you and I be safe. And we proclaim and we pray for each one of you. But let us not be so lax or lethargic in our approach in these last days. God has given us wisdom and understanding. It is not political, it is not a propaganda. It is simple truth that you and I have to be absolutely very careful and pray about it every day. And I'm telling you, the Lord will be able to keep us safe and secure in His arms. The only way to keep us safe and secure is Jesus Christ. So let's go to him and be able to be a part of him. And today's sermon is entitled as the living water. And somebody was asking me a question, when was water created? When was water created? And the water was always there before. In the beginning, 
I don't know when was the beginning. I don't know how you know this water was created, but one thing we know that there are two components in water. One is one person of hydrogen and two person of oxygen. If hydrogen and oxygen is separated, and then you will never have water. Since the combination of these two chemicals is enjoined, water comes to existence. In the beginning, before God could create a life on this earth, there was water, there was darkness. This water is a component which doesn't have any taste, any color, any shape. It is a liquidy form. And this is much more beneficial and much more used component than any other component in this world. Either it might be insect, either it might be you know, animals or uh, human beings. We have to use water for everything, almost everything. Anything you prepare, you need water. And do you know that water is a cleanser, which can remove toxins, which can be able to you know, wash either externally and internally. I don't know how, what God had in mind when he created water, but I know that water is essential, is beneficial, and without water, you and I can never ever survive. Water is essential for life. A human can survive almost two months without food, but he will never survive a week without water. You know, there was a story told about a child. Dad took a child to the neighborhood county to visit the place where he grew up. One particularly hot day, when they were home, such an outing, when Dad suddenly pulled off the road, a small outcropping of a rock. I remember this one. Uh, if I have to go to my place, uh, when I'm in India, it is a mountainous region. You know, we went for a trip. As we were going to a trip, uh, we could have uh, uh, you know, uh, we felt uh, thirsty, we had waters in our bottle, but still, we had, you know, the stream of water just gushing through the wall, you know, the rock. Have you ever tasted, uh, you know, the spring water? I don't know how many of you have tasted the spring water. The water what we use at the moment is, uh, you know, is always uh, uh, stored and it is preserved with a lot of chemicals and things like that. The taste is entirely different from the natural spring water. In my place, we go get spring water every day. Uh, the, the place called Chikmangro, where the coffee estates are, and uh, we have a lot of mountains, and water just comes through. We don't have any filters, nothing. We just go, you know, take water and drink. You know, that taste is entirely different. Entirely, entirely different. The taste is absolutely entirely different. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus said he is the living water. I remember the story where the children of Israel were traveling in the wilderness. When they were traveling in the wilderness, they were thirsty. They complained, goes to Moses. And he says, Moses, have you called us all the way from Egypt? Here we don't have water to drink. There was a complaint. And then Moses pleads with the Lord. And the Lord said, you see the rock there? You see the rock there? I want you to speak to the rock. And you will be able to get water out of it. And you will be satisfied. I'm telling you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that Moses was absolutely very angry. You and I know that. Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. But still, water gushed out. And I know that Peter talks about and he says that rock was Jesus Christ. When you see the water running by the rock that is chemical free, that tastes better because it is pure, and this lesson that we can learn from the story of Moses and the rock, because of the Beauty, you and I will be able 
able to get hold of who Jesus is all about when we talk about the rock of salvation that is Jesus Christ. He is the living water. Even though Moses struck the rock, the water gushed out of the rock, and that water was absolutely pure and tasty, which quenched the thirst of the children of Israel. If you have to go and take a trip to Palestine, you will be able to understand a very important thing. You see, it is extremely dry in condition. Water was a precious commodity in Palestine. It is available in plentiful supply only during the rainy season of the year. During that time, you know what did the Hebrews do? They would always collect water in a cistern. They had large wax carved into a rocks. And that when the rainy season ended, they would still have water. What they were probably grateful for the stagnant system water during the time of drought. The Hebrews knew the superiority of living or a running water. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't know the condition of what these Palestinians were going through in a desert land. When they talked about water, they preserved not any time that you got water. Only during the time of rainy rain season, you know, you get water. Listen to the story. Okay, listen to the story. You know a place called Sika, where Jesus means this woman at the well. I don't know the condition of the well, how much water was there. You and I will be able to at least get an important part of what happened there with the conversation there with this woman. And that's what we read in John. Let's turn the Bible to John chapter 4. A very important aspect of a lesson that you and I should be able to learn. John chapter 4 was 10 to 14. The Bible says it very clearly. The Bible says it very, very, very clearly. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, who is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked for him, and he would have given thee a living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then thou hast been the living water? Verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his camp? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Verse 14. And whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never ever thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, living water, Jesus is not only the bread of life that he supplies, the water of life too, without water, fish die, and all the living things eventually die. In John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39, there is a very important aspect of it. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39. The Bible says it very clearly. In the last days, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this faith of the Spirit, which they had believed on him, should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So in this context, Jesus is speaking, connecting holy water to the spirit. So connect this with the woman at the well who asked for water. 
I don't take for forget, Holy Spirit is the gift of God to his children in the last days. I don't take for forget in the last days that you and I will not have the famine of food, but you and I will have the famine of the word of God. So what the Bible is trying to clearly focus and tell it is when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. When Jesus was talking to this woman at the well and says, if you know that I am the person who are, is a living water standing before you and the water which I give you, you will never be able to be thirst. There are three symbols of water. There are three symbols of water. Number one, it is the cleansing of the soul by baptism. So when you and I are baptized into Christ in water, by immersion, through the Holy Spirit, yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is that you are accepting Jesus to be a part of you. For all your needs, you depend on him. For all your life, you depend on him. For anything that has to be fulfilled of your heart desire, you depend on him and his word to be outpoured by his spirit. It is the cleansing of the soul of baptism. Your soul and my soul has been corrupted because of sin. Your soul and my soul has gone astray from God without accepting Jesus as a personal savior. So once you baptize accepting Jesus as a personal savior, your Christ through his spirit starts working on your behalf and my behalf. In Ephesians chapter 2, or Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26, the Bible says, uh, it is to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water and with the word, and that is the Holy Spirit. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that you and I are to be cleansed that can happen only by the working of the Holy Spirit in our heart and my heart. Many people, our hearts have been hardened because of the way of life that we have gone to. Because sin has engulfed our lives. Yes. Just like this woman was unable to understand when Jesus was talking about the living water of himself. And of course later on she understood. With this woman, Jesus was not talking about the earthly water. This is why the woman is surprised and sarcastic. If you have living water, why do you ask me for a drink? You see the woman was asking about. He was talking about a fountain that bubbles up and overflows. That is the spring of water. Look at verse 14 of John chapter 4. It is saying, the gift of God is Jesus Christ, his son, the savior of the world. So we are going to always, when we look into Jesus Christ, he is the gift as a fountain within. Christ's gift as a fountain springing out by its own power. Christ's gift as a fountain springing up into everlasting life. It is a Christ gift as a fountain within. So the cleansing has to start taking place from within. Many times we forget within. We are only carrying our cleansing outside. You see? Cleansing from within plays a very important bit. Most people survive on extreme supplies. They are rich, happy, and strong only when outward circumstances make them strong, happy and rich. If they are physically weak, they are not strong. If they are not going their way, they are not happy. If their money leaves them, then they are become so poor. And that's the condition of humanity today. Earthly fountain satisfied temporarily. We may drink of the fountain of wealth as deeply as we may, but it will not satisfy long. We shall thirst again. We may drink of the fountain of fame as deeply as any man ever drank, but the satisfaction is but for an hour. We may drink of the fountain of worldly pleasure, of human science and philosophy and the earthly learning. We may even drink of the fountain of human love, but none will satisfy long. We shall thirst again. My dear brothers and sisters,
sisters in Christ, uh, many times earthly fountains only make things worse. It is like drinking ocean water. The thirst is quenched for a few seconds, but it comes back with a bigger thirst than before. Many times earthly fountains only stir up our thirst instead of quenching it. It is never enough. It is never enough. Our appetite grows by what it feeds on. And a little drink from the earthly fountain today leads to a bigger appetite tomorrow, much like a person who is like an alcoholic. A little taste today leads to a bigger drinking binge, binge tomorrow. Philippians chapter 4 verse 12, the Bible says it absolutely clearly. I know what is to be in need. And I know what is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether we feed, we are, uh, 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 whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in water. How do we learn the secret of living a contentment life? Align ourselves with Christ. The Bible says uh, this word will never satisfy you. This word will never quench your thirst. Uh, and that's the reason the Bible says, I am the one who is the living water. Come unto me that I will be able to give you everlasting life. A thirst which quench forever through the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says it very clear. Drinks from the spring of living water and you will never be thirsty again. We will always be tried to external circumstances unless we are dependent upon Jesus Christ. If you and I have Christ in our hearts, then life is possible, peace is possible, joy is possible, under any circumstances and in all places, everything which the soul can desire, it possesses only in Christ and Christ alone. The woman at the well had an emptiness. The woman at the well had difficulty. The woman at the well was thirsting from much more than the physical water which she needed. And you could see Jesus satisfying the soul. Satisfying the soul. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if Christ lives within us, then he, we will be like a fortress which has in our courtyards a fountain fed from souls high up in the mountains and finds his way into the fortress by underground rivers which no one can ever touch. It does not matter who surrounds such a fortress. Those who are inside can survive for years with abundance of water. Christ's gift is a springing fountain for you and me. Water moves mainly by gravity. It slides down a riverbed by gravity. It can be pumped and lifted by man's engine. It might be driven by winds or affected by the moon. The ocean has currents that are driven along by wind and by heat and cold. But a fountain rises by energy with it itself. It is the symbol of joyous and a free activity. We see the promises of God's word in our lives uh, if you and I depend on the springs of living water that is Jesus Christ. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when Christ is in our heart, he fills us with a joyous energy that makes us delight to live uh, and to work. We want to do more, indeed, we have to do more because we have energy within us, sir. Uh, what that is more in line with how the Lord made us an activity or an energy that springs from within the God's power. We are not driven by commandments or by someone who is over us with a whip. If we do not allow the law or someone, then we are punished so that we must walk because of a boss. No. Romans chapter 8 verse 2, the Bible says, Through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. That's the beauty and the promise that God has given above the law is Jesus Christ. Above our life is Jesus Christ. If you and I cling on to who Jesus is all about, that is the rock of salvation who gave water in the wilderness to the children of Israel, who quenched the thirst of the woman who was at Sikha. 
is ever willing to satisfy our souls. We are not slaves to external circumstances. Our life should not be determined by our environment. Our life should not be determined by our environment. Oh yes, the great deal of our makeup comes from our environment. However, to have our environment completely control us is not the will of God. It is not the circumstances as to control our life that you and I have to be mastered in controlling the situation and the environment and circumstances of our life only by the grace of Christ. So you allow the cleansing of your soul through your Holy Spirit to be cleansed and your outlook is entirely different. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God wants something better for us and it is available through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. If He is our hearts and lives, we cannot help but have something different from this world. Young people, do not let the world mold you and make you after its will, but let Jesus mold you and make you after His will by God's masterpiece, not a product of this corrupt world. Don't be fascinated, don't be alarmed, don't be carried away by the things of this world because the things of this world is absolutely temporary. You have to come back again because your thirst will never be quenched. God is calling for much more higher than this. John chapter 16 verse 22, the Bible says, No one will take away your joy that is in Jesus Christ. Christ's gift is a fountain springs up into everlasting life. A fountain raises and then falls because gravity brings it down. The fountain raises higher and higher and one day it will finally reach our goal. It will reach its source. I'm climbing higher and higher and I can't come down. There are two things which is very important. It is eternal, eternal consequences which is more important in your life and my life. The gift springs up everlasting life when we go, it goes with us. You can't take it with you. When it's done for this world, will perish. What is done for Christ lasts forever. May we not be like some rivers that run and never go anywhere. There are rivers that go through deserts and then evaporates away. The river perishes. However, if you and I are Christ's gift within us, the river never dries up. God wants you and me to be a part of Him. So that He wants to see that our lives are always in green pastures. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the good shepherd who wants to lead his sheep not astray. He wants to lead his sheep in green pastures. So that we can be fragrant, we can be happy, we can be joyous, we can be at peace. Whatever the circumstances that you and I might be facing in this 21st century, whatever the sickness that you and I might be facing in this 21st century, whatever the difficulties and the thirst that you and I be able to be facing in this 21st century, God is calling you and me. And He simply says, just like He said to Moses, speak to the rock. The living water, the light of the world. You and I have an opportunity to communicate. Go beyond. Go beyond. The Lord is mighty. The Lord is great. The Lord is all powerful. The Lord is all knowledgeable. As is said to Moses, speak to him. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and it shall find. God is calling for a relationship. He is asking that you are thirsty, you are barren, ask of me and I will give you. He wants you and me to be in constant touch with him. He wants you and me to be in constant relationship with him so that you don't lack anything, anything. Either it might be health, either it might be a physical position, whatever it is, you come to the Lord and you will never thirst again. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the lives of many men go creeping along the surface, what they might spring up to heaven, 
What are we aiming for? We are destined to reach through the gift that is Jesus Christ, the higher ground that is eternal life. God is calling you and me. He's helping us to be a part of Him. We are living in this crisis. Health is very important. You know, as I was uh, going through the news, it really brings tears into my eyes when I see people suffering without anything. People suffering from sickness. People suffering from destruction of natural calamities. People are suffering with mental trauma. People are suffering, don't know what to do, how to go for it. People who are suffering with ailments, with financial criteria. The only way that we can find solution is in back to Jesus Christ. The only problem solver of our lives. You want to see the miraculous things happening in your life and my life. You want that the joy, peace, and happiness that only God can give us. Jesus is the living water. He's the only living water. There is nothing that can satisfy it. Then going to the living water, that is Jesus Christ. And just remember the story which is around in John chapter 4. When this woman at the well, conversation with the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, after the conversation is over, she understood what Jesus was talking about. She understood that he was the Messiah where the forefathers were waiting for her. She understood that when he started talking about her past, she understood Jesus when he started to reveal about her secret. She understood Jesus about when Jesus was communicating with her with love and compassion. She left the board, ran to the village, and sent the gospel message of who Jesus was all about, put a foundation for Jesus to enter into the village and be a quenching their thirst. And you see what happened after which. I don't know there's nothing much recorded, but one thing I know, this woman put the foundation for the village for Jesus to enter in. And I know that when Jesus entered into the village with the help of this woman, I don't know how many people were thirsty spiritually. How many were physically been crippled with? I think so. Everybody were facing difficulties and problems and sickness and whatever problems they had. Everything was absolutely healed because Jesus stepped into the village with his woman. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the only thing is allow Jesus to work in your heart. The living water which will cleanse your physical maladies, which will cleanse your spiritual maladies, which will cleanse your mental static. He will, he will, he will, and he will enable you to be energized because he is the living fountain. And one thing is, you and I have to open the way. Jesus is the one who supplies the water. He paid for it for, with his life. Will you take the drink and let the fountain of God's grace bubble up and overflow in your life? Don't ever be a fish out of water. Take hold of Jesus. And you and I can survive. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, just like the water, physical water, which is very essential to keep your health intact, to cleanse externally, to cleanse internally. But for our spiritual cleansing, we need Jesus. 
I like to read one verse from the Bible, which is recorded in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. The Bible says this very clearly. Therefore, with joy shall he draw water out of the wells of salvation. Therefore, with joy shall he draw the water out of the wells of salvation. If you and I will be able to give ourselves to Christ and Christ alone working in each one of our hearts in these last days, whatever the situation we might be, we will certainly draw water from the well of salvation and available only to this great man called Jesus and Jesus alone. Let's give ourselves to him in these last days. This world things are absolutely going to pass away. The things of the world is not so permanent. So stick on to the words of eternity that is Jesus Christ. And as it says, I am the truth, I am the way, and I am the life. And he says, I'm going to give you life in abundance. Anyone who comes to me will never thirst again. May God bless each one of us as we contemplate and may he be able to quench our thirst of our lives. When people are deprived, of a thing. They generally get along pretty well without it. However, when there's something that you need or require, they suffer horribly in his absence. Yes, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, what is that absence in your life and my life that can fulfill? I believe that is Jesus Christ and his salvation. May God bless each one of us as we contemplate on this world and be able to be a part of it. So that our life might be aligned with him, so that our thirst might be quenched. And he's always given a friend for you and me. And if you have Jesus, you have everything, nothing that lacks is for you and me. And that's called the beauty of friendship that you and I could have position with Jesus Christ. In closing, let's all join in singing the song 499. God has what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus.
for he answers everything to a king of his love that you care for us. A friend who is always ever faithful in our sorrows. A friend who knows our weakness, our strengths. A friend who knows about the thirst that we are going to hide. And Lord of heaven, may you quench our thirst. So that our Father, as we come to the living fountain that is Jesus Christ, as the deer panted for the waters, Lord of heaven, may you help us to be a part of you. We need to be quenched by our thirst. So that, O oh Father, we might be free from all maladies and difficulties on this earth. Rely upon you for the future days of our life and our sustenance. And serve you, Father, we might be safe and secure in the arms of Jesus Christ. Thank you for everything. Continue to help us throughout the whole week as we enter into another week. If it is time then, till we meet again, let your presence go with us. In Jesus' name. Hope you're keeping what I'm saying. Please do not forget to reach out to us with any concerns that you might have. And please do not forget to support us with your rights and offering too. And then thank you to our website, website.org. Send us my email. God bless you. And see you next week. Until then, keep safe. May the Lord, in His own mercy, bless you all abundantly. Maranatha, Jesus is coming again.